Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton, and you are watching or listening to the Empire and Deep State series that I'm co-hosting with my friends over at the American Exception podcast. This series is based on the book, American Exception, Empire and the Deep State by the political scientist and historian, Aaron Good. He's the co-host of this series and the American Exception podcast with Seamus McGinnis. And we're going through the history of the U.S. Empire and Deep State. And now we're in the JFK administration, and this is part five of our discussion of Kennedy. Before we talked about Eisenhower and Truman, and before we talk about what the Deep State is. So if you're watching, you can check out the playlist in the link below that has all the other episodes. And if you're listening to the podcast, I'll also be sure to add that link to the playlist. Now, in the past part about JFK, in the previous parts, we talked about JFK's foreign policy in his first year in office in 1961. We talked about, we originally uh, talked a little bit about Bay of Pigs, and today we're going to talk much more about Bay of Pigs. But we also talked about the Vietnam War, uh, U.S. policy in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, uh, the death of Dag Hammarskjöld, who was the, form, the Secretary General of the United Nations. And in the previous section, we talked about JFK's economic policies and his fights, his political struggles with some large corporations, especially U.S. Steel. So we're going to talk a little bit more about his domestic policy today, and we're going to take, take a shift away from Asia and look toward the Kennedy administration's policy vis-a-vis -vis Latin America. So Aaron, let's talk about what Kennedy's foreign policy looked like in Latin America. Of course, this leads up to Bay of Pigs. At the beginning of his administration, do you think that his foreign policy in Latin America differed much from his predecessors, or was it mostly the same? Well, here again, you see the schizophrenia of the Kennedy administration, uh, which I hope will become pretty clear to uh, listeners as we go on here. He advocated for a, he announced that he was seeking to have an alliance for progress. Okay, he called for this new agency for international development, which at the time was, it was this new agency and it was not at the time known as something that has always been and forever will be uh, a, a cut out of the CIA. I mean, it was, you know, working, it was intertwined with the CIA oftentimes, but like, this was not exactly what it was intended to be a full on cutout, but that's what it becomes. He called for a loan of $20 billion, loans of $20 billion uh, to Latin America and to it was to promote democracy and undertake meaningful social reforms, especially land reforms. And at the time that he announced this, it was the largest U.S. aid program created for the developing world. So on March 13th, 1961, uh, to more than 200 Latin American diplomats, he uh, makes this announcement and says, let me be the first to admit that we North Americans have not always grasped the significance of this common mission. At the same time, many in your own countries have not fully understood the urgency of the need to lift people from poverty and ignorance and despair. So you can see that he is, I, he is uh, so in a way owning up to Yankee imperialism, although in a delicately phrased way. But he's also calling out the local oligarchs and you know who are connected to the system of international capitalism, who the comprador class, you could call them. These people who are very wealthy in their own country and who kind of maintain the political economy that is favorable to uh, international capitalism. And uh, so this is this is notable. Um, I, there's a few documents that are I have a couple of pages from the speech that he he gave here. Uh, written down. And there's a, things that he says here are really noteworthy when you think of what the policy has been ever since then. Uh, he says, if we're to meet a problem so staggering in its dimensions, an approach consistent with the majestic concept of Operation Pan America, okay? Our approach must be bold, right? It calling on all people in the hemisphere to join this new alliance for progress. Um, to satisfy the basic needs of the American people, meaning Latin American people, for homes, work, and land, health, and schools. Okay, and then he says it in Spanish as well. So this is um, th this is another example of where American liberalism at this time, and it, this is largely vanished from the discourse, which I think is really 
notable, they're calling for more or less the same kind of material goals that socialists would hope to be able to achieve. Uh, this was the idea of liberalism at the time and the idea put forward in the Atlantic Charter and, and Roosevelt's Four Freedoms and so on is that you that, that liberal democracy and capitalism could produce uh, healthy societies and prosperous societies and that those these could be achieved with capitalism and capitalism could work and could could do good things and that it was good to have a society where people's material needs were taken care of, which seems like it should be the most obvious thing. But if you notice, you know, these are these are not the way people speak now about things. It's like this is just uh, not the way it's done. He says the living standards of every American family will be on the rise. Basic education will be available to all. Hunger will be a forgotten experience. The need for massive outside help will have passed. Most nations will have entered a period of self-sustaining growth. And although there will still be much to do, every American republic will be the master of its own revolution of hope and progress. So if Joe Biden were to say this today, it would be a shock to people. I mean, this is I, I get that it's rhetoric and we can see that he wasn't able to to, to uh, uh, you know, affect all these changes. But this was what he was saying he wanted to do. And it's, and I, I believe that he was sincere in hoping to try to do these things. OK, uh, he sent a delegation to Uruguay in August of 1961. The U.S. did. And when they this is a photo, I have a photograph here of him uh, greeting these the delegation upon their return. And uh, he, he gave a speech about the alliance. And he said that the alliance aimed to achieve full recognition of the right of all the people to share fully in our progress. For there is no place in democratic life for institutions which benefit the few while denying the needs of the many. Uh, this means the inclusion of workers and farmers, businessmen and intellectuals, and above all, of the young people of the Americas. So uh, what this really means in practice is what he was promoting were, and this was endorsed, by the way, this charter of Punta del Este uh, was endorsed by all the, this, the U.S. and Latin America, by the U.S. and Latin American states, except for Cuba, because they didn't, they realized, they identified this as sort of a bourgeois, you know, counter-revolutionary thing, which in some ways it definitely was, uh, but they wanted land reform, tax reform, uh, economic modernization, and more democratic governance, rather than, you know, a series of coups and juntas all the time. So what it included in practice was uh, construction of housing, schools, airports, hospitals, and clinics, water purification projects, distribution of free textbooks to students. Okay, and this is the, these are this is the progress part of it. Now, the aspects of it that were shortcomings were that uh, it didn't call for or promote nationalization of U.S. enterprises. Uh, it didn't really reform seriously uh, the laws about U.S. multinational corporations and their profits and, and the taxation systems in place. Um, and under LBJ, of course, all of these, these programs and aid uh, conduits that existed were more or less uh, completely turned to fund repression all around. And so this really is a, a, a incomplete, flawed effort, but perhaps, I, I would say well-intentioned effort that was undermined ultimately uh, by, by, by the forces that run the U.S. empire and that ultimately undermined Kennedy's presidency and ended his life. But these were what they tried to do. And you can see a difference between LBJ and, and Kennedy on this, even on these sort of generic policies for development in, the, in Latin America. I do agree that we we see a turn with the Kennedy administration. I think there has been good documentation of the way that the Alliance for Progress, uh, at least whether or not he was conscious of it, the money was used for a, a series of coups in the, in the early 60s. And uh, and just generally, you know, I guess the more cynical take to put it out there is a lot of the time that that the Alliance for Progress was sort of giving with one hand and taking away with the other. And the idea that how do we counter the sort of Castro movement of, of revolution in South America. And it's to, to again, like we keep talking about, sort of co-opt that into, well, we want revolution too. We want, we, you know, we're, we're pro-revolution. We're, we're the first anti-colonial nation. Uh, and so I think it's kind of a continuation of the same narrative that we've been talking about, while at the same time, maybe JFK thought he could play a different game within the same rules. Uh, and, and as we see, I think he runs into a lot of roadblocks with that.
But uh, in the same way, I think um, Greg Grandin points this out in Empire's Workshop, that Teddy Roosevelt did a lot of the same thing, sort of speaking out of one corner of your mouth with, uh, with revolutionary rhetoric, while sort of wedding that with the counter-revolutionary in a way that tends to be very effective, whether or not uh, specifically the Kennedy, Kennedy administration uh, sort of knew that it was making that, that marriage. Um, so I, turning to maybe a specific example to talk a little more about uh, JFK's approach to Latin American politics, how did the Dominican Republic become a key spot to, uh, to test out these policies? Well, under Eisenhower, we had uh, our man in uh, Santo Domingo, Rafael Trujillo, who was running uh, as the, the country as a dictator uh, for a, a number of years. I think he'd been in power more than a decade uh, by the time that Kennedy came to office. But he was a problem for the U.S., especially in light of what happened in Cuba. But even before then, as early as 1958, uh, and this was still under Eisenhower, obviously, the CIA station chief in Dominican Republic, a guy named Lear Reed, uh, and several Dominicans plotted an assassination plot of Trujillo, which, uh, which never got off the ground. Um, this is documented in William Blum's Killing Hope. Um, in February 1960, this, the National Security uh, Council gave consideration to a program of covert aid to these anti-Trujillo people. And then two months later, Ike approved a contingency plan, which provided in part that if the situation in the country got even worse, Quote, the United States would immediately take political action to remove Trujillo from the Dominican Republic as soon as a suitable successor regime can be induced to take over with the assurance of U.S. political, economic, and if necessary, military support. So this guy Trujillo was, uh, I mean, he was so vicious that it was, it was a problem. He was seen as somebody whose regime was fragile, sort of like Batista's was in, in Cuba. Um, and he did some other crazy things, like he tried to actually kill the Betancourt in Venezuela. He put a car bomb, uh, he tried to get him with a car bomb and it blew up, but it didn't kill him. And he survives this in June of 1960. And he tells the U.S. Secretary of State, if you don't eliminate him, we will invade. OK, so this is this is a problem. We've got one kind of right <laughs> right wing ish U.S. friendly guy in Venezuela saying, I'm going to go and invade this this other guy. He's he's loco. <laughs> he tried to kill me. Uh, so this is, um, you know, th this is really a, a problem. There's an infamous case with Trujillo where uh, he has this guy basically kidnapped. And this is something that Alan Dulles gets involved in with a, a cover up and so on. I'm probably facilitated in some ways. Stories told in uh, David Talbot's Devil's Chessboard. But he had this guy, uh, Jesus de Galindez, who was a I believe he was born not in uh, Dominican Republic, maybe in Argentina. But he was at Columbia University and wrote a Ph.D which later becomes this, this book, but it was all about the crimes of the Trujillo administration uh, and what a despot he was. So Trujillo, uh, you know, as any despot would, he has this guy kidnapped and uh, brought to the Dominican Republic and you know, was tortured and killed. And I think even a woman who reports on it later, who's a Dominican, uh, who, who leaks some details of it, she was also murdered by Trujillo's regime. Uh, so he was a really nasty guy. He, occasionally he would take some of his political enemies and feed them to sharks at this remote part of, uh, you know, on the island. Uh, he would have guys fed his sharks. So he's kind of like a like a Bond villain or, or, or something like that. Um, and this was a problem for the U.S. He was so odious that this was like he was too much for the for the U.S. Now, according to. Um, the records of the CIA, only three pistols and three carbine rifles were ever given to these anti-Trujillo forces. It's not certain that they were ever used in the assassination, although this is kind of a questionable. Eventually, he is assassinated, okay, on uh, May 30th, 1961. And uh, you can see, uh, well, this is Kennedy talking about it when Kennedy takes office. This is very early in his presidency. But Kennedy's talking about the situation in, in Trujillo uh, in, in Dominican Republic. Uh, and once the guy's assassinated, you know, Kennedy says there are three possibilities in descending order of preference, a decent democratic regime, a continuation of the Trujillo regime or a Castro regime. We ought to aim at the first, but we really can't renounce the second until we are sure we can avoid the third. Whew, that's an awful and, quote. <laughs> it's it is. 
but it ref and it's it can be interpreted uh, in, in in different ways. It can be interpreted as the generic a generic reading could be like this is just kind of Yankee pragmatic Yankee imperialism. You know, they don't want they don't want a Batista type regime or a Trujillo because it's unstable and might lead to a Castro regime, and that's the only reason they would ever support democracy. Uh, or it could be taken as Kennedy formulating something in a way that would be palatable to these national security people and their general cold war mindset uh which i think you know is something that kennedy would have to do and something that they do at other points which will come will circle back to this but you know this is a this is a notable quote um so this this was the position that they were in what are you going to do with this country what kind of a regime are you going to put in yeah, and I mean it. It this history is important because it's not, we're not doing a hagiography of JFK saying that he was perfect and he was a great here like idol that everyone should emulate. It's more to understand that despite the fact that he had all of these contradictions and was not de he was not a socialist. He was not a revolutionary. Obviously, he was U.S. president. Despite all of, all of those comments that he made and and some of the positions he took, he was still assassinated for not being enough of an imperialist, not supporting coups and wars and regime change sufficiently enough. So, I mean, it's it just goes to show how right wing the US empire is and how even someone like JFK, who is certainly not, you know, what you consider to be, you know, significantly on the left, he's still too left wing for the political establishment. And, and you know, in terms of the Dominican Republic, we know that the CIA was actually interestingly involved in the assassination of Trujillo after the U.S. supported him. So there's this kind of interesting love-hate relationship there. It's you know similar to Saddam Hussein, similar to Noriega in, in Panama. So there are interesting historical echoes there. But so what was the JFK administration's policy in terms of this idea of creating a so-called decent democratic regime in, in the Dominican Republic? Well, he ends up doing something very strange in the history of U.S. foreign policy. Um, he there's a there's a, he's shot in a car. Basically, Trujillo is gunned down in a car uh, with some people on different sides of him, crossfire something like this, right, to try to kill him in his car, and um, which is they also try to get De Gaulle in the same way, and then uh, Kennedy himself gets killed in apparent crossfire in a car. So this is apparently a popular way to kill people around this time. Um, but, and it's a question as to whether it's never been established that the U S that, that, that the U S uh, gave approved this assassination. They did try to help these guys earlier and they made planning for it, but there's never been anything showing Kennedy did this. However, I did see a video once with Fletcher Prouty, where he was talking about how one of his duties uh, in between the Pentagon and the CIA was to coordinate uh, w weapons and logistics for covert operations, including assassinations. And then somebody pressed him on this and said, like, name one, name one. And he was kind of flustered because he's like, didn't want to name it. And then finally, he just sort of blurts out Trujillo, Trujillo. So was was that actually a reference to something that Kennedy had approved? Or was he talking about this because the church committee actually acknowledged it, even though they said that, oh, it wasn't, it didn't end up being the ones that killed the president. They sort of soft pedal it just like they do with Lumumba. Who knows? But what is remarkable here and what that what happens and is not really repeated in, in any too many cases that I know, if any, is the U.S. bumps off a right wing despot and actually puts in a progressive uh, left left wing leader, more or less. He allows him to come to power. A guy named Juan Bosch, uh, who was elected in 1962 with over 60 percent of the vote. And he stays and he tries to govern along, you know, progressive lines as much as you can under the conditions that he where he takes office. September 25th, 1963, he is actually ousted. OK, a right wing military coup, a military and civilian junta takes over. This included a Yale educated millionaire who had been among those charging Juan Bosch with uh, being a, a communist sympathizer. Uh, but JFK does something, you know, pretty Amazing here in September, in the fall of 1963, he, uh, within hours of the of the coup that, that gets rid of this progressive guy, um, he suspends diplomatic relations with Dominican Republic, and he ends all orders all economic aid to be ended. 
On October 4th, he announced all military and economic assistance personnel were being withdrawn from Dominican Republic. Uh, the news accounts of the time said the decisions were made personally by President Kennedy, who served emphatic notice that the programs would not be readily resumed. This condemnation of the coup was repeated by Venezuela, Mexico, Bolivia, Costa Rica. And by mid-October, this junta was accusing JFK of interfering in Dominican Republic's politics and complaining about the U.S. attitude towards them, the U.S. government's attitude towards them. So this is remarkable because this is a the U.S. really aggressively trying to reverse a right-wing coup in a, in a country, a, an anti-democratic right-wing coup. Uh, but Kennedy doesn't have much time left. Juan Bosch would go on to write like a, a book that's moderately famous about the military industrial complex and the basically ab about the permanent, the privately incorporated permanent war economy in the U.S. and why this uh, helps to explain uh, certain aspects of the U.S. empire's behavior. So this guy was a good leftist and Kennedy uh, really worked to get him put into office and then tried to stop his ouster, uh, which, of course, Johnson totally reverses the policies we'll get to in a future episode. Right. And, and and Ben, I think you put it really well that we're not trying to idolize JFK. And I want to be clear because I know I keep kind of taking pot shots at the Kennedy administration the last few episodes. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to undermine what Aaron is laying out here because I think, you know, at Ben, as you said, it really comes down to it's such small differences. And what we see over these decades domestically is the way that the New Deal ideals that the thought was we could universalize this to the rest of the world and try to put together a similar sort of like Keynesian consensus, not just here based on exploitation abroad, uh, but that we could expand those uh, those ideals to other societies. That was sort of the, the mission that inspired so many people through this sort of like liberal internationalism. And to some extent, we have to take them at their word, I think. And so I, I don't think it's it's wrong necessarily to say that that was these kind of better angels of, uh, of liberal uh, philosophy. But why we talked so much about theory is that uh, the New Deal starts to look like treason because it is contradictory in itself. You, you brought that up that uh, essentially uh, when you get down to it, uh, imperialism itself becomes more overdetermined than any one president or any one powerful person uh, can, can try to push back against. And so whether or not you're well-intentioned, you're constantly being undermined by the fact that you have this belief that the answer, again, is more liberalism, more of the same. And if we just do it more effectively, it'll it'll sort of resolve those things. Uh, and that's what we see with the Alliance for Progress. Uh, and it kind of tends to turn back on itself because it inflames these sort of revanchist movements. Uh, you know, we, we take advantage of comprador classes within the Dominican Republic. We're about to turn to Brazil. We see it again and again because it inflames them when you try to push for something like the New Deal. And, uh, and you see the way that it's coming into conflict, not just with the financial elements in the U.S., but the way that they have allies domestically wherever they go. Uh, and Kennedy is constantly being undermined by both of those groups for, for those exact reasons. So I think those become more heightened or they become more obvious the more, uh, the more capital is getting thrown around, the more resources are on the table. Uh, because that is more that they want to be, you know, integrated into the free market. And if we maximize the liberalism there, uh, that that will that that will bring prosperity. And regardless, again, of the genuine belief in that, uh, I think those it becomes harder to suppress those contradictions in more resource rich nations. What, what you know, we've talked about Parenti saying that certain countries aren't poor. And we're going to turn to Brazil now. Brazil, of course not poor at all, but as, as we see repeatedly, uh, they are rich in resources and we're making sure that the people are poor. So turning to JFK's policy in Brazil, then of course, it's the most, the largest and the most resource rich in Latin America. It's probably the closest that, that South America has to, uh, a nation capable of autarky, that it can have some amount of autonomy and it becomes a lot harder to control as a result. Uh, at least from above. So how does JFK approach Brazilian policy uh, in light of all this? 
So Brazil is this extremely large and resource-rich country, and as such, it is a big part of U.S. foreign policy in the region, and also it has an enormous amount of uh, Western capital invested there over the years, um, especially the Rockefeller business empire um, is, is huge. There's a whole book on this, which is really a fascinating book with like the longest subtitles ever, but it's Thy Will Be Done written by uh, Gerard Colby with Charlotte Dennett also. And I mean, it's just, it's all about the Rockefeller uh, business empire, especially in Brazil. So it's, that will be done the conquest of the Amazon, Nelson Rockefeller and evangelism in the age of oil. But it's the, the stakes here are very high in Latin America. There's just so much of the richest people in the world. I mean, United Fruit was just a fruit company around, especially around the Caribbean. And they had like all, this enormous U.S. establishment backing uh, to overthrow the government of Guatemala. So think about Brazil, which is even a much bigger prize than Guatemala and uh, you know has much more U.S. capital invested there. And you start to understand why these issues are so important for the U.S. So the previous guy that, that was in, that was running Brazil, as JFK takes office, is a fellow by the name of uh, Hanyo uh, Quadros. And he appears here on the cover of, of Time Magazine, uh, but he didn't have he didn't have very long at this point in his uh, tenure because the military was uh, going to remove him. He only lasts for seven months, forced to resign under military pressure. Uh, and as he, when he leaves office, he names this U.S. ambassador at uh, Adolf Burl, a Rockefeller man, and ambassador John Morris Cabot, U.S. Treasury Secretary C. Uh, C. Douglas Dillon or O. Douglas Dillon, Douglas Dillon. Kennedy's treasury guy, but also a guy who'd worked under Eisenhower um, as being among those who contributed to his downfall. Dylan was also somebody who advocated for the overthrow of Lumumba as well. So Dylan is uh, Dylan Reed, Wall Street law firm um, in Wall Street Investment Bank. The people, some, who, some of whom were behind the creation of the CIA, you know, like James Forrestal, the first defense secretary, super establishment guy, uh, a family of oligarchs, really the Dylan family. Um, Dylan, uh, according to this ousted president of Brazil, sought to uh, mix foreign policy uh, with Brazil's need for foreign credits. So he he really wanted to use the the, the U.S. economic power to dominate Brazil and determine and tell the generals you know what to do and to overthrow this guy. Uh, both of these guys also Burl and Cabot, who were involved in the ouster of uh, of Quadros here. Uh, they were advocates for the 1954 overthrow of Arbenz in Guatemala. Uh, and as this unfolds, Arbenz in Guatemala is sort of similar to the guy in Brazil uh, that gets elected, and that is uh, Yao Galar. He's the vice president, and he takes over in Brazil once they get rid of um, Quadros. So he, he uh, takes the presidency in August 1961, uh, despite the fact that there's this like virtual coup and a civil war, more or less, almost like a simmering civil war by segments of the military to block him because he was seen as another dangerous kind of leftist person. But because of a number of loyalist military units and other pro-constitutional elements in Brazil, uh, Galera was allowed to take office, but only with symbolic power. So he's like the Queen of England, more or less, except he's like the president of Brazil. Um, after working with the Kennedy administration and, and following some of their recommendations, there's this plebiscite and the po powers of the presidency are restored to Galar. And so he can actually try to govern Brazil. Uh, he moves in 1962 to limit the profits that multinational corporations could take out of Brazil. Okay. Because typically these guys are like almost like absentee landlords. They just make a lot of money and it all goes into the Western financial system or wherever else they want. He also nationalized a subsidiary of ITT, a CIA connected, you know, huge company, famously CIA, infamously connected to the CIA, infamous as, in terms of its involvement in the Chile coup uh, more than a decade after this in 1973. Um, ITT at this point lobbies for an amendment to a U.S. foreign aid bill that would make it so that any time a country nationalized U.S. property, uh, then all aid would be suspended to that country. So this was a way to like say, you will not nationalize foreign investments anymore. JFK himself worked hard to uh, lobby and defeat this bill 
for this amendment. He even lobbies Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York, to try to come out publicly against it. And he's at the same time, he's pressuring Golar to settle with ITT, which they do. They up the compensation from $6 million to $8 million. But Golar is not done. He pursues land reform, sort of modest land reform uh, packages. But in Brazil, there's a really strict stratification there. And there's a, a really bloated oligarchy that uh, opposes any, any measures to help uh, the majority of Brazilian poor people. Um, but at, so and they don't like Gula, that Goulart's doing this. Uh, the idea that he would nationalize Hanna Mining. I mean, Hanna is an old Rockefeller connected company. Hanna is the same family that was very close to um, McKinley back in the day, pushing the Spanish American War. So this is like the really the heart of America's transnational imperialist establishment. Um, and if they were going to have their mining concern nationalized, uh, especially iron mining in Brazil was huge. This was a, a real threat to them. So uh, Kennedy is attempting to, he, he shows some public support, but he also, the CIA under Kennedy, they really have a number of programs that undermine Galar. He's really trying to, the Kennedy administration is trying to get Galar to uh, back off some of these proposals, even as Kennedy is trying to like keep these laws from being put in place that would, so that countries still could potentially nationalize U.S. assets. This is still like something that he recognizes. So the schizophrenia of Kennedy's policy is really on display here in uh, Brazil. But uh, he also changes it so that the, the central government of Brazil doesn't receive aid directly. It goes to um, regional governments and other right-wing politicians that are favorable to the CIA, that are compatible to the CIA. So this is uh, a, a case where Kennedy's trying to balance all of these forces and uh he doesn't overthrow galar okay that's that's uh, to me the key but he doesn't really help him and i, I can under i can understand why from the kennedy administration perspective when you understand like how much just how much how much crazy amounts of money and capital were invested in brazil the the, the pinnacle of the establishment was had this as a profit center for a long time so it's not just this the anti-communism and that you want to be always on the lookout for anti-communism which was a, a you know part of the cold war but enormously powerful political actors in the u.s were very fixated upon these uh capitalist enterprises not being trifled with by uh reformists in any way and and kennedy did not for for whatever either he was sympathetic to them as people would argue if you're an anti-kennedy person you could argue that kennedy had some sympathy or affinity for these uh types or you could say he's trying to balance uh, manage his you know political capital as best he can and it takes a lot of political capital to confront these people in this way directly over certain actual tangible assets that are invested in a foreign country hard to say but the Kennedy administration and the rhetoric of the Alliance for Progress and some of these reformist measures that he wanted to put in place. You should compare this to uh, a quote here in Fortune magazine. Uh, this is a nice cover of Fortune magazine in 1962 uh, of, of Latin America. And there's a, this guy, Charles V. Murphy. He was a close friend of Frank Wisner, the guy who was the CIA fail boy in Hungary in 1954, when they sent in the tanks, you know, to, to crush this uprising that Wisner helped gin up. And in Indonesia, he also was a big failure. He ran the OPC, ran covert operations, ran the so-called mighty Wurlitzer propaganda apparatus of the CIA during this time period. Okay, so this guy, Charles V. J. V. Murphy, writing in Henry Luce's Fortune magazine, uh, says Brazil was an example of one of these Latin American nations that refused the IMF's demands for austerity and free market policies. So this wasn't the era of the Washington consensus, but even back then, the U.S. was attempting to use these policies to constrain third world development and make it more receptive to uh, U.S. capital. And this quote, I think, is like the really telling one. Brazil is one of the countries where JFK is foolishly trying to satisfy the universal lust for industrialization and growth. And this, I think, is the mindset that doesn't often get articulated, but it's really the mindset of people like Rockefeller. Uh, and, the, and Henry Luce, these, these people who are the champions of international capital, uh, that, that Kennedy would be out there and really looking to help leaders and to be able to modernize their countries, even coming up with this liberal guy to, to formulate a kind of theory on it. 
you know, Rostow, we talked about modernization theory, that you could have this development and a sort of positive capitalist teleology in a sense, right? But in reality, these super oligarch types are, this is the mindset that they like, they don't want these countries. He says, universal lust for industrialization and growth. That makes it sound like it's just unmitigated gated greed, you know, using the word lust. And what is it really saying? It's, they're talking about people who would like to have electricity and running water and be educated and have health care and so on. OK, and JFK is foolish to try to do this because what these guys really want in the developing world and they try to pr produce this and reproduce it as much as they can is for these people to be perpetually, you know, uh, hewers of wood and drawers of water, you know, like they want them to be underdeveloped backwaters suitable for uh, U.S., you know, expropriation of resources, U.S. plunder. Uh, they, they, they see something like Indonesia where the population is very, very poor and the resources and the wealth just gets sucked out of the country or Congo. They see that as like a good model. Okay, this is the, Brit the British Empire's model. And, uh, you know, this is uh, the, the neocolonialism. They still pursue these kind of policies today. Look at how they try to roll back these reforms today. Um, and you, you, see, you see the mindset. I think that this is really key. They want these countries to stay poor and underdeveloped uh, because that makes them easy marks for U.S. Uh, capital penetration. Yeah, I mean, it says everything. It, it shows that they really have a zero-sum worldview where you can only get richer by underdeveloping other regions of the world. You cannot have mutually beneficial development. And I mean, it's, it's, this history is important and interesting because it shows that, again, Kennedy was not, he certainly wasn't an anti-imperialist. I mean, again, he's the leader of the United States. But even the differences that he had with the other elements of the U.S. foreign policy establishment Although they weren't significant, they weren't massive, they were enough for them to kill him. <laughs> like it shows once again. And someone like Joao Goulart's a good example of this. Like Goulart is seen as basically in Brazil's history, there are in modern history of Brazil, there are two left wing leaders, Lula and Goulart. That's basically it. Everyone else was a right wing neoliberal leader or a straight up right wing military dictator. So the fact that Kennedy, although he wasn't necessarily like a good friend of Goulart, the fact that he was not trying to organize a coup to overthrow him is significant, especially considering what happens after Kennedy is assassinated. So again, it shows that there can be a, a, a leftist critique of Kennedy, but we should be careful not to have an ultra leftist critique of Kennedy because just saying that they're all the same ignores the fact that after Kennedy was killed by these same people, there was a coup against Goulart in Brazil. So, I mean, talk about what happened. In, I mean, I kind of spoiled it already, but talk about the changes in Brazil policy after Kennedy is removed by a bullet going through his head in 1963. Right. Well, there's a, uh, I mean, I, I kind of spoiled it myself also, um, but saying that he does obviously get overthrown, Goulart does under uh, LBJ. And um, I would say that, it's it's a mystery as to what JFK was really doing. I mean, in um, in William Blum, he says there's an interview. He cites an interview with Vernon Walters, okay, because Vernon Walters is the CIA guy who was a point man with the plotters who actually get rid of Goular. Um, and it says um, that Vernon Walters arrived in Brazil after having been apprised that the, that President Kennedy would not be averse to the overthrow of Yao Goular. Okay, so that's a guy who interviewed. Vernon Walters later, but Walters is a very shady character. And this is also, it's its not even clear that it was delivered that Vernon Walters is claiming that Kennedy told him this in particular. So Vernon Walters is a CIA guy, but he's not the top CIA guy, but he plays a key and decisive role in some weird things, especially around Watergate and so on and in other areas. So he's a very spooky deep state character uh, who I think is worth looking into even more. Um, and Peter Peter Del Scott is, agrees with me on this that he's a really important character. Um, so it's this is this is dubious. It's kind of similar to when Richard Helms' deputy talks about JFK approving the Castro assassination plots. It's like these guys are all liars and killers. And so, without a paper record, how do you know this? But we'll come back to this idea. Um, but a key to looking at what happens 
I think, and the changeover here is it comes from this book. And this is just a kind of a throwaway passage, maybe, but it's a book called Hidden Terrors, The Truth About U.S. Police Operations in Latin America. It's written by a journalist named A.J. Langeth, published in the, I think, in the 80s. And then Mark Miller put it as part of his Forbidden Bookshelf series where you can get ebooks, which they have some really good books out there, by the way. If you're interested in looking at some of these like hard to find books, you can get ebooks of them. But here's a passage from it. Um, out of Washington came news of the creation of the Business Group for Latin America, a linking of U.S. business and U.S. government with David Rockefeller, president of Chase Manhattan Bank, presiding over 37 executives of such corporations as Standard Oil, United Fruit, U.S. Steel, Ford Motors, and DuPont. It would attempt to deal with the continent's political troubles. Uh, late in January, the members had met at the White House with President Johnson, AID Director David Bell, and Johnson's Latin American coordinator Thomas Mann, who was no partisan of the Kennedy administration's Alliance for Progress. The businessmen reported being received with a warmth they had not felt at the White House for three years. So this small change uh, that we would perceive is something that they noticed even more so. Um, and this is this gets into you know, what people want to sort of mystify the U.S. oligarchy. Sometimes people would want to say like, maybe the, you know, like that Marvel movie where there's like the Nazis, there's a Nazi strain in the U.S. And like some people want to make arguments that like Paperclip was really like a secret Nazi takeover or it's like some, some Freemason or Illuminati or Satan worshiping thing. But like when it comes down to it, I mean, had that fortune quote, you know, the guy saying like, oh yeah, they have, they love the siren song of industrialization and modernization. But this betrays what really the worldview is of these people. And as Fletcher Prouty used to say this, and I think that there are some things that he was dead on about, but when he talked about Dulles and Lansdale and these guys and like what they really believed, he said that they were essentially Malthusians, meaning that they believed that there was a too much, uh, that, that people would breed, multiply faster than resources would uh, allow them to. And so you, it's not good for there to be so many poor people in the world and so on. And they also believed in social Darwinism, okay? So if you believe in these things, then you think that you are the sort of, not literally the master race, but that you are basically, by virtue of your status, it's sort of some kind of evolutionary proof that you're like worthy of making these decisions. And also that there's really not enough resources in the world, so it's totally justified to try to keep people uh, really, really poor and not allow them to, to develop more because then they would just consume more resources. And that this is really the mindset of, of these guys. Uh, but it's kind of, it's very, very convenient, perfectly tailored to justify making enormous amounts of money in commerce, uh, which I think is is the key uh, to understanding why they would adopt this. Don't it, They're not interested in making money because they're social Darwinists and Malthusians. They are Malthusians and social Darwinists because it is a perfectly compatible way of, of viewing humankind uh, if, if your primary concern is, is, make, is accumulating wealth and power. Right. So turning now to uh, earlier, I mean, we've talked before about Cuba now, but we want to come back to it a little more because JFK got into kind of banana war style uh, chicanery in his early years. We see coups in El Salvador in 61, uh, I think Honduras, uh, Guyana, Bolivia, and then Guatemala again in 63. Um, and then, of course, the Bay of Pigs uh, coup attempt in Cuba. So how did Cuba figure into JFK's Latin American policy and the Alliance for Progress? Well, we've talked a bit about the Bay of Pigs already, so we're not going to go into deep detail about that. But the aftermath of the, the fiasco is worth looking at, and especially how it leads to the creation of Operation Mongoose. So um, in the... Shortly after the Bay of Pigs, so the Bay of Pigs happens in April and the, the same time that the Laos debacle unfolds also. And on May 6th, there's a uh, meeting of the National Security Council, and it is agreed that U.S. policy toward Cuba should aim at the downfall of Castro. JFK orders the CIA to produce a full study of Cuban vulnerabilities in ways that they might be able to go after them. Um, on May 24th, Dulles is working with this special group that includes people like CIA officers uh, Richard Bissell and Tracy Barnes. They were supposed to meet uh, also that day with Richard Goodwin to discuss this these operations that they were going to launch against Cuba. By June, Dulles is seeking guidance on how much support to give to these Cuban exile groups. 
at the time, uh, he was thinking maybe ninety thousand dollars a month, which comes to uh, about you know seven hundred fifty thousand in in twenty twenty dollars. Um, in June, on later in June, there's a s- internal CIA memo that goes beyond even what had been proposed thus far, talking about uh, base facilities, sabotage school, uh, a new mothership to facilitate missions. And there were people in the White House, like Schlesinger, who took a kind of dim view of this. Uh, and he, Schlesinger put this in a memo to uh, his colleague, Richard Goodwin, who happens to be married to, I don't know if he's still alive, but he was married to Doris Kearns Goodwin, who's like the ultimate liberal normie historian, who goes on like the Daily Show and stuff to talk about her books about President Lincoln and stuff. Um, but this guy is a Kennedy person. He's an interesting character. We'll come back to him uh, later in the series. But um, he, Schlesinger writes about this and uh, about these plans and sends this to Goodwin. Uh, Schlesinger is the historian, the sort of court historian of Kennedy, uh, the Kennedy presidency. He was in the OSS. He's like a liberal anti-communist guy, and a, a, an interesting character, kind of a, I want to say a pitiful character in some ways. Uh, but we'll get into that more when, after the assassination, because he basically understood the assassination, but was too much of a coward to do anything about it. But anyway, he saw that this Cuba stuff was a little dicey and uh, he saw that the CIA was recruiting these exiles for operational purposes, but not uh, looking to recruit people who could actually build political strength to uh, potentially oust Castro. They were favoring mercenaries and reactionaries, people who were associated with Batista, and they were discriminating against those groups most eager to control their own operations. Uh, and including groups that were more like liberal groups. The CIA had an affinity, surprise, surprise, for right-wing thugs rather than liberal people who might want to have some sort of democratic system operating in in Cuba. So later on, they come up with a plan uh, that they present almost 14 million for 1962. Uh, It gets cut to about five, uh, a little over 5 million before it gets sent to JFK. By August, This Cuba task force adopts a public posture of ignoring Castro while attacking civilian targets in Cuba. And they write, our covert activities would now be directed toward the destruction of targets important to the economy of Cuba. Uh, Refineries and plants using U.S. equipment were specifically mentioned. And they were going to act through these Cuban exile groups um, to try to find the real resistance to Castro. They will do, will do all we can to identify and suggest targets whose destruction will have the maximum economic impact. So they're really looking to, you know, see, lay siege to the economy. The memo shows no concern for international law or the unspoken nature of these operations as terrorist attacks. So this it probably doesn't even need to be said, but I'll, I'll, I say it anyway. This is par for the course for the U.S. This is the idea that you'd be like, well, wait, isn't that against international law? Doesn't even come up, but it is. It's illegal because the U.S. operates in a state of exception. On October 5th, the White House issues in SAM 100, and it requires a plan for what to do if Castro is removed from leadership. And the Cuba group um, asked CIA's Tracy Barnes for an up-to-date report on the status of the program. And they look to start planning infiltration operations and sabotage operations within 30 to 60 days at this time. So we know around this time that JFK is already having some political disputes with the CIA. Did he push back against any of these operations? What what was Kennedy's actual position when, when this planning was happening? Well, it's a good, he's cagey. He says one thing to one group of people and then one thing to another group of people. And this is behind the scenes. The public statements are often, you know, boilerplate-ish in terms of like being anti-communist and expressing support for uh, people who are against Castro. Um, but then there are these interesting anecdotes coming from Kennedy where you he gives, he, he gives a hint as to what he was actually trying to deal with. Uh, One case is a conversation on October 9th uh, with a journalist named Tad Shulk. I'm not sure if you pronounce it the right way. I think it's one of those Eastern European names. So, Um, But in this conversation, this is what the document looks like. So it's blotchiness is not my fault. Uh, JFK expressed the need of controlling CIA in some way so that CIA wouldn't construct another operation like Bay of Pigs. 
said CIA was a problem in government. He and Bobby wanted to deal with it. <laughs> okay, so he's telling this to a reporter. Uh, regarding, and he, he took notes on this, so that's why we have this. That later, he was interviewed about this like a decade later, maybe in the House Select Committee investigation. But um, regarding Cuba, which uh, Shulk had recently visited, JFK asked about how strong Castro regime is, etc. whether new guerrilla operations by U.S. would make sense. Uh, so this is, he's already kind of, you know, talking, trying to get something from this guy. P part of the difficulty of being the president is that your briefers have enormous power to basically present reality to you. That's the the beauty or the the perils of the president's daily brief, right, from the CIA. So that the world as it exists is in the president's mind is that which is presented by the CIA oftentimes, because that's what the CIA was created for is to control the information. So Kennedy had his ways of trying to get outside information as best he could because he knew, he understood the perils of listening to these guys, especially after the Bay of Pigs and other episodes. So Shulk's notes continue, and I think this is the most interesting, fascinating part. Um, that he writes in his notes, then suddenly the president leaned forward and asked me, what would you think if I ordered Castro to be assassinated? Uh, Shulk replied, such an action would be a terrible idea as it would strengthen the regime and the U.S. had no business in assassinations. Kennedy responded by saying he was testing Shulk and that he felt the same way. JFK noted that he raised the question, quote, because he was under terrific pressure from advisors, I think he said intelligence people, but not positive, to okay a Castro murder. Uh, Kennedy then mentioned that he was going to set up a special group on Cuba. Okay. So this gets into the issue of assassination and what did Kennedy authorize? Did he authorize the Trujillo assassination? It, there's no proof of it, but there's it, there's ever there's a lot of reason to suspect the CIA was involved and Kennedy may have done it. You know, there's not evidence, but in this in these kind of cases, as I cover later in the book, there's a written kind of a mafia law, almost a mafia logic in place uh, about some of these these things and the most some of the most the most class, top secret of all kinds of communications are handled orally, okay, intentionally to not create a record. And this is part of what these guys do. This is, and it adds layers of deniability that are convenient even to presidents potentially, but for the agency as well to stick to these things. So, um, you know, I, I already mentioned the Proudy comment, but if you look at the other things related to the assassination at this time, Here's something very interesting related to Cuba and Kennedy. So this is a document. Uh, this is a screenshot from in the background here uh, from the ZR rifle CIA document, November of 1960. So under Eisenhower, William Harvey of the CIA, um, he writes that in planning this, ZR rifle was the program to get rid of Castro and involve mafia people like um, uh, Johnny Rosselli, Santo Traficante, these kind of guys. And he writes about how this operation might be carried out. And this part, I think, is really you know, pregnant with, with meaning here. Uh, should have phony 201 file in records integration to backstop this. All documents therein forged and backdated should look like a CE file. Um, cover planning should include provision for blaming Soviets or Czechs in case of blow. So they're saying a 201 file is just a personality file for the CIA. And it's saying that if we're going to have this program to kill Castro, we want to have a 201 file on the on you know an assassin, and it's going to be backdated and made to look like you know legit, um, so that it looks like a regular file. And then as cover, we need to have somehow orchestrate this <clears throat> to allow us to be able <clears throat> to blame the Soviets or the Czechs. Okay, so this they're they're talking about cover stories. Okay, now the. Of course, the significance of this later is Lee Harvey Oswald's very strange CIA file, 201 file, and his background is seem, would conform seem to conform to this, um, and also the idea that you're going to bake into the cake here ways to be able to blame the Soviets for, for this, okay? Because this is really what happens to JFK. This is why, and William Harvey is a guy who uh, his own colleagues. Uh, believed was likely involved in Dallas. Uh, there's testimony to the House Select Committee from a guy that worked with him that he was, he seems to have been involved in it. And there's question, he reportedly told somebody he worked with at the CIA that he had been in Dallas in the month of November. 
um, not exactly on the day of the assassination, but then. And he was CIA chief in Italy at the time, wouldn't have much reason to go to Dallas. His travel records are still withheld, by the way, by the CIA, the, uh, William Harvey's. So this is notable on the issue of assassination. But then we get into this issue of, well, did Kennedy authorize these? And there's no evidence that Kennedy was authorizing these assassination plots against Castro. There's really no solid evidence at all that's uh, documented. There's just statements from other people. So uh, there's a guy named um, Honey Wolf Honeycut. He's a, on Twitter. He sent me this a while back, and I think it's notable. Um, this is from a secret memo that Schlesinger sent to JFK regarding Cuba, and he writes, uh, the character and repute of President Kennedy constitutes one of our greatest national resources. Nothing should be done to jeopardize this invaluable asset. When lies must be told, they should be told by subordinate officials. At no point should the president be asked to lend himself to the cover operation. For this reason, there seems to be merit in Secretary of State Dean Rusk's suggestion that someone other than the president make the final decision and do so in his absence, someone whose head can later be placed on the block if things go terribly wrong. So the fact that they're talking in this way, what does this say? Well, it says that they recognize that the president can't be seen as okaying these kind of things. That's part of it. But but there's also a little more here when you say someone other than the president make the final decision and do so in his absence. This could also mean that the president has delegated these things to committees or whatever, and that he might, if these committees are 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 taking responsibility for these things, and the president has more or less said okay or has not objected, they don't want him to object because they don't want it to blow back on him. This could be a way of allowing these groups to act kind of autonomously and with the excuse that like, well, it's for operational purposes. We don't even include the president in these discussions so that he wouldn't be compromised, but we have some way of knowing his mind or, or whatever. So it, it's really a mess to try to figure this out. Castro himself told Jackie Kennedy that because Jackie Kennedy went to Cuba. This is document. This is written about in David Talbot's book, Brothers. Uh, Jackie Kennedy, years later, met with Fidel Castro and said, we never tried to. My husband didn't try to kill you. And then Castro said, "I know, essentially, I know. I, I don't believe that he did." Um, so was Kennedy okaying these things? Did he okay the Trujillo assassination? Did he okay this other assassination in Iraq uh, of Kasim uh, that happens in 1963? It's hard to say. Kennedy himself told De Gaulle, "No, I'm not trying to kill you," because De Gaulle said, "Hey, your, your CIA is trying to kill me. Why are you? Why are you? Why are you trying to play me like this, sir?" Uh, Mr. President. And Kennedy says, well, you know, I didn't try to kill you, but I can't vouch for the CIA. And, and he may, I think that that may have been truthful. I think it was truthful. I don't think Kennedy wanted to kill the Gaul. But this is the, 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 the danger of having the CIA operate the way that it does with all these groups that nobody keeps tabs on, you know, that go back, stretch back for several administrations uh, with all sorts of guns floating all over the place and networks and so on it's impossible to say anything definitively and you can't prove a negative like this. So who knows if he authorized the assassination or not? I tend to think he didn't. There's a CIA inspector general report that says he did not, that he never ordered the assassination of Fidel Castro, that the agency was acting without presidential sanction. But that's the kind of thing you can never say a hundred percent because you can't prove that kind of a negative. You can't prove that I didn't order someone's assassination before we started recording, you know, like as a metaphysical certainty, like, it just can't be done. Uh, and that's the nature of the beast. What, what are you implying there, Aaron? Is there something you want to confess? <laughs> well, you you too, Ben. I mean, I don't know what you were doing before you got on the phone here. I can we prove can't... it. <laughs> I mean, it's very, it's not yeah, no, it's 100% a, it's a good impossible. Point. But it's just, that's it. Proving a negative in these you areas can't of prove power a negative, and secrecy, yeah. you, you can't. Basic scientific method. Yeah, so you talked about how the Soviets and the Czechs were supposed to be blamed uh, if if uh, assassination plot got blown, and we saw that we talked about the Dag Hammarskjöld assassination last week. That uh, when documents do come out, you can say, "Oh, that's a Soviet forgery." We talked about it with the the John Paul uh, the for the second assassination plot that was supposed to be blamed on the Soviets as well, but that was also blown open with the with the Turks. Uh, and we see this, you brought up William Harvey in Italy, and we see this repeatedly there where there are these right-wing terror plots that they try to blame on the left or blame on the Soviets or blame on the Czechs. And you always find a scapegoat that you can uh, lay off any blame and, and hide your own involvement. 
And again, it's sort of the uh, the Saddam Hussein logic of, uh, hey, if we can't see the weapons, then that must mean that they're even more powerful than we ever thought. And as long as you have that boogeyman, you have something to, to hide behind. But we also see the way that the Cubans that just sort of hang out for the next 50 years after the Bay of Pigs, you create this sort of mercenary force of, uh, of counterinsurgency. We're looking at that across the world, but they're also on U.S. soil at this point. And the, the Bay of Pigs people are probably the, the chief, especially through the 60s and 70s, uh, the main characters for the uh, U.S. version of it. So those uh, that that group is why you're able to draw a direct line from the Bay of Pigs to the JFK assassinations, I'm sure a lot of listeners know. And in between there, we see Operation Mongoose. So next week, we'll turn to Operation Mongoose and the uh, the Cuban operations uh, leading up to the assassination. But to wrap up today, if you want to just talk a little bit more about what you see as the legacy of JFK's Alliance for Progress. Well, unfortunately, the legacy amounts to not a whole lot. He was much more appreciated in Latin America uh, than other U.S. leaders. And if the, Juan Bosch did an had an interesting interview that you can find, I believe, at the JFK Library, where he talks about how Kennedy really was the guy, only guy who understood what people in, in Latin America were experiencing, and you know, he seems to evince some suspicions about the assassination as well. But here you get into how JFK is kind of inscrutable. You know, he he's trying to reconcile irreconcilable interests, okay, in the United States. There's his own uh, sort of New Deal linked ideas of, of fair play and justice and progress and so on. But then there's the reality of the, the Cold War. We've been talking about how the changes that he makes are mostly minor, but then we still should think of them as take them seriously because he does get assassinated. And that is uh, true up to a point. However, as we will get into when we start talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis and its aftermath, eventually Kennedy does try to perceive or pursue dramatic changes to the United States and its posture in the world. He wants to end the Cold War. He realizes that the Cold War is the trump card of these guys, and he goes right at it. And he uses the, uh, the, the fear over nuclear annihilation as a way to, to rally the public behind him. And this was this was, I think, terrifying to these uh, people because they they were looking at the same thing that Kennedy was looking at. They were looking at how the they knew that the cold because they knew even more than Kennedy that the Cold War. These people like Atchison uh, and Dulles, they knew that the Cold War was largely a fabrication to justify uh, U.S. imperialism and the U.S. Uh, 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 taking over the entire system of colonialism and then transitioning it to neo-colonialism under U.S. auspices, uh, and that keeping Western Europe from trading with the Soviets was a way to uh, manage this, this global system uh, to the benefit of the United States, not to the benefit of, of Europe. And they're still trying to hold them in that kind of a thing and re-engineer that now, as we see, it's wrecking the economy of Europe, but it's all you know related. So Kennedy did does recognize that the Cold War itself is is based on a number of dangerous kind of myths and that it really limits his ability to do much of anything. And so eventually he goes right after it. I think that that's where it's, it's that's how we can make sense in my mind of, of what his real intentions were. The problem is that by coming president of the United States, Kennedy had essentially taken control of like a, a mafia type organization. I mean, they're lawless and you have all of these greedy interests that you have to uh, make sure that they still don't have any of their rackets disrupted. I mean, that's a big part of it, but it's never packaged in that way. It's all done in this sort of establishment, respectable, gentlemanly, uh, you know, veneer. But that's really what he was dealing with, some really ruthless people. And they were more ruthless than he recognized, more ruthless than his brother recognized. Uh, but th this is what he was uh, ultimately trying to confront. And he did it in so sort of fits and starts and in ways that seem kind of pitifully inadequate now, if we look at the Alliance for Progress. Uh, but to me, it, it shows the trajectory of his presidency, shows that he did understand the inadequacy of these programs and understood that the structural uh, constraints imposed by the Cold War were uh, were huge and that they needed to be swept away. And that's what he was attempting to do. Uh, and that's why when he gets killed, RFK sends an envoy to Moscow and says, look, the quest for peace is on hold because Johnson's a right winger. <laughs> 
Uh, we know Kennedy was killed by right wingers. The quest for peace can't resume until Robert gets to the White House. I mean, this is what they knew uh, at the time. So I tend to believe that he he was serious uh, and that some strident leftists are not really correct in their uh, take on on Kennedy. And uh, this is so, so I hope to elaborate on this more in future episodes. But this is what I would say about the Alliance for Progress. That it was yes, it was inadequate. And Johnson, whatever there was that was good with it, Johnson basically uh, abandons and turns it into something worse. Uh, but Kennedy uh, tried and he did it in sort of devious ways at times. I think he, he dissembled to certain people and told the public things that he didn't even really believe. And that's just a part of the presidential job description, unfortunately. But um, it's, it's, it's fascinating to look at what he tried to do, what he wasn't able to do, and then what happens after him. I think we can learn a lot from his, his example. And, you know, he's it's sad he's, he dies the way he does, but it's 2022. He'd be dead either way. So we don't have to dwell on that too much. But uh, the bigger tragedy is what it, what it means for the world. And we'll get into that more later. Well, yeah, there's still a lot to say, even just about JFK, not to not to mention LBJ and all the other administrations. So we're going to end this part here. This was part five of the history of the JFK administration. We're going to continue with Operation Mongoose. We're going to talk more about Cuba and Bay of Pigs leading up to the 63 assassination. I'm Ben Norton, and I'm joined by Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis of the American Exception podcast. You can get early access to all these episodes by supporting their podcast at patreon.com slash American Exception. And if you're watching this, of course, if you want to get early access, definitely check that out. And, you know, we will be back very soon with, with more episodes. So I want to thank everyone who watched or listened, and we'll see you all next time.